Hi all, I have another amazing Leela Chess game to show you and we're escalating the IDs. This is ID 521. At the time of this video, this is one of the peak uh, self-learning rating achievements IDs, very high on the graph. Now, John D's given me a present with this game. He's basically uh, explored one of my favorite immortal games of all time, one of Nesmetinov's. Now, Nesmetinov, renowned for his imaginative attacking style, according to many sources, famous, his most famous game officially was in Sochi 1958 against Polgievsky. That's considered by many to be one of the greatest attacking games of the 20th century. However, I prefer his game against Chernikov, which was a major hit on this channel, absolute major hit, which was a, a positional queen sacrifice. And John Dee's given us a presence on this channel. He's let us explore that amazing game up until the point of the positional queen sacrifice. So let's have a look. I would urge you to check out the other video, the classic video uh, reference of Polgashki's Chernikov. I'll put that in the pinned comment of this video. So Leela Chess 5 to 1 against Stockfish 8. More details about hard will be put in, in the pinned comment. Uh, so later, so Sicilian defense from Stockfish 8, Knight F3, Knight C6. We have the open Sicilian, and then we have the exaggerated Vincetto Dragon, so exaggerated Dragon. Uh, now Knight C3, Bishop G7, Bishop E3, Knight F6, Bishop C4, Black Castles. So this is all the same move so far as Polgiavsky against Chernikov. Knight G4. Queen takes g4, knight takes d4, queen h4, queen a5. Now white castle kingside and bishop f6. And the story goes that Chernikov was playing this to, he just wanted to draw with black. And on queen h6, he was just going to repeat and expect a, a draw. However, there was a shocking surprise awaiting for him instead. Nesmetinov played queen takes f6 instead believe it or not so this is the end of the book the virtual book given for this game to explore so we have a very advanced leader chess playing white so this check is thrown in by black to get the knight away from that sensitive d5 square e takes now uh, Nesmetinov played knight c3 to get back to d5 and that still is a priority here. This move is chosen instead. It's another route to d5. Okay, we have rook e8, knight d5. So very, we, we've transposed to the same position again after bishop d4. Now, Chernikov played king g7 in their game, but here, stockfish 8 prefers queen d8. Now, in the, in the Nesmetinov game, there was a maneuver rook d1 to d3 to f3, and later, only later, did the f pawn move uh, when things got uh, more interesting, to say the least. So, this is a very interesting position to explore. White has given up the, the queen. And one of the strategic themes uh, which really impressed me was actually prior to the game, I. There's a book called Most Instructive Games of Chess by Irving Chernev. And one of the beautiful games early on in that book is the knight on d5, how he can sort of conduct an attack. Once you have a knight on d5, which is difficult to sometimes remove, it can really create attacking potential. So here, uh, two pieces being sacked for the queen. There's great attacking potential. White plays f4. Now clearly, if black ever black has to defend f6 here for this, then knight takes f6. Just to acclimatize you to this position. Black is really quite defensive at the moment. We have a strange looking move, rook c6 being played by Stockfish. And now actually, Leela goes for f5. So this is actually already very, very different now from that stem game. In that game, d6, I believe, was uh was used. Uh, so we have we have a departure, a very interesting departure. We have g5 now. And now h4, just trying to fragment black's pawns. So this is already very interesting to explore if black dares take this. 
are the dice pawns just a visual issue or a real technical issue? Let's have a quick look at this. If black dare take here, then rook f4. These pawns are all now much more vulnerable being diced like this. And for example, like this, fixing down black on the queen side. That reinforces the f6 pawn, but what white can do here is actually slide the king and, and use the h file, as this variation shows. It's very dangerous. So this is just an example variation. We have knight e7 coming in with the idea of bishop h6 chatmating the queen, in fact, is an amusing, highly amusing variation, well, at least to me. So I hope to you as well. So h4, uh, it could cause some severe problems if this is taken. So that whole h file could be a target for h7 if this is taken. Something to bear in mind for your own games. If you want to dice up pawns, there's good prospects later. b6 is played, rook a e1. Bishop b7, aiming to try and get rid of this maybe later. There's d5 knight. But now, <laughs> Leela is a real fan of fawn pawns, T-H-O-R-N. I don't know how this happens. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's my game picks. I'm subconsciously pick, picking these games. But after H, G, F, G, we do get the dreaded fawn pawn. Yeah, T-H-O-R-N, fawn inside. This is a really dangerous pawn. Clearly, it supports e7 and g7. Clearly, it, it stops escape squares of the king. Either on g7, if the king was coming out, it would be the e7 escape square. There's a lot of perks to this pawn there. We have king h8, rook f5. Now, stockfish 8 plays queen f8. This is tactically on a, hanging on a thread already, actually. It's very dangerous. But white shouldn't take on g5. There's too much counterplay here. Leader plays rook e3. If taking on g5, there's counterplay generated. Queen h6, this way, queen h4 hitting e4, potentially. Uh, I'm doing some other stuff as well. Right, rook c5, rook f3, bishop takes d5, and then sacking here, and then rook g8. Black actually has the edge. So white has to be careful not to activate black too much. That beautiful knight could be removed, and it could become unclear or even better for black slightly. So actually Leela builds up the pressure, rook e3, no rush to take a pawn on g5. Rook c5, black still keen on sacking the exchange one way or the other to get rid of this monster knight. In fact, white doesn't want to touch the bishop on d4 because that's beautifully centralized, just takes on g5. Quality of pieces is a priority. Queen h6, rook g7, so the form pawn already assisting now, that rook g7. Black does take on d5. E takes. This is necessary, I believe, because here yeah, that allows rook takes c2. And in fact, black could then, for example, escape with draws in some of the lines, like perpetual check. So nope, don't want that to happen. E takes d5. We have rook f8. And now the move c3, which is ingenious. Because it means that bishop d1 is actually a key move, and you might wonder why. Because if there's a check on the back row, if there's a bishop on d1, it's not check basically. And why is that important? Well, I'll show you. Well, rook h3, we can see the check being a right pain here. Uh, for example, here, as well as checks on f1, are painful, where black's uh, even position, holding h7 there. But uh, this move, yeah. It creates this idea of removing that possibility of the check on the first rank soon. Uh, we have rook c8. But now, actually, in this position, changing uh, circumstance dramatically, actually. Uh, if if there was a normal move played, let's, let's give a token move, then this bishop d1 would be really strong here. Give an example. Here, rook h3, bang. Because there's going to be a mate... Without the check here, this is just mating. So that's the key idea, stop this being check. But with this, this is changing the picture slightly. Rook c, c, a. Okay, we have the move d6 now being played instead of bishop d1. Rook c, e8, see black's going to challenge that rook. And white's now ready for this challenge on this central file with two kind of... <laughs> Form pawns, two kind of form pawns, it's working side by side for rookie seven. 
Uh, so rook c8 is played here actually, avoiding exchanging on e7. If taking on e7, d takes this position, I think gets amusing variation here, where basically there's rook takes f7, threatening rook f8 check. And there's something really stunning in this variation, by the way, <laughs> which you might find unbelievable in its own right. White's plan play a fabulous tactic, which you might never have seen the likes of before. If I give you five seconds, there's a fabulous tactic here. Rook F8 check. You look at this bishop and this bishop and how they enjoy each other's company after bishop d4. <laughs> so not not taking on f8 because of queen takes f8 no just just f7 check is going to be mating here uh so for example here this is this is this is winning e8 to distract the rook so f7 check um uh winning the rook on <clears throat> e8 is enough with check more than enough so we have rook c8 not getting into that stuff but now bishop takes f7 yeah black's falling apart here it was also the position's really strong at this stage so if you want to look at the variations there's the pink comments i'll give but this is also really strong white well, can actually escape the checks it seems by this stage in this line it's a bit tedious to escape the checks but white ends up being better with two connected past pawns over there so bishop takes f7 anyway rook c5 uh, here, white can escape the checks. Just to prove that, check, 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 check. Okay, bishop f2, for example, Let's say this, and then more checks until, yeah, they get stopped, and white just eventually crashes through, basically, in this position. This is just an example variation. White eventually crashes through with big advantage. Okay, so... Rook c5, not bothering with trying to check the white king. Rook g4, we have. Queen c1 check, king h2. Now, check here. So rook g4, that means the king's a bit shorted. Rook g5. Rook takes d7. Rook takes g4 check, king takes. Queen h1. Bishop d5, holding g2 for a moment and threatening f7. Check with the pawn. Check with the queen block check with the queen king goes into g6 check rook g7 and after rook takes g7 the game was adjudicated here as a win for white so if it carried on at move 42 the answer to life universe and everything if you read douglas adams f takes g7 check this position uh, king f6 is sufficient for winning for example queen c4 king e7 these pawns and the bishops are absolutely lethal the queen's got a nanny the diagonal because otherwise bishop d5 so the queen's kind of tied up but now white can make progress here off the check here d7 white's making big progress for example like this wins material queening that pawn and then check check getting the queens off queening that other pawn uh, here, as an alternative, by the way, uh, as a token move, if black doesn't do much, then king c8, check, king b8. This this situation is it's just going to be downhill for black. Black's queen's not doing anything against the pawns, really. Uh, we could carry it on a bit. <laughs> anyway, you get the picture. So let's go back to the game where it was adjudicated as a win for white. Rook takes g7, so... This is this is absolutely crushing after this FG seven basically. So it's wonderful present from John D exploring an immortal game. We can do that with all sorts of immortal games. So if you've got any favourite immortal games you want to explore, let us know, and maybe I can pass that on, or John will read the comments of this video. So yeah, it was a very intriguing game for me to have that as the start position, the queen sacrifice. On the evidence of this. The queen sacrifice is kind of liked by leader it seems was able to beat at least stockfish eight with it so there's definitely uh some positional compensation there's method was a kind of genius 
and had a very, very good intuition for attacking positions. And that kind of is echoed here by this example variation of his amazing game that he played against Chernikov. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Comments, questions, likes, shares, appreciated. Thanks so much.